You see, God wants to understand what makes you tick. How did you get to this place? He wants to heal you of your pain. He wants to heal you of what you've been through. He wants to take that and that's not a burden that's too great for him. What else do vices do? They draw us further from God. The reason being is every time God is trying to reel us in so he can deal with us, we push him away farther and farther because of our shame. When we focus on our vices and we use them to cope, when we use them for comfort, it increases fear. You find security in that habit. You find security in that bad habit. You're afraid to progress. You're afraid to move forward. You're afraid to see your life without these things that have been holding you back for so long. And if you are afraid, then you're in bondage. Hey family, we're gonna be continuing our series, Comfort Food. And as we see here, I got a whole lot of it. So we're gonna get into the word. So last week, Evangelist Gershom was talking about vices, right? And vices are, you know, it's, it's known as immoral conduct. It's known as bad habits, right? So a vice can be different things to different people. But for our purposes, we're gonna go into what the word of God says. So starting off, what is a vice, right? A vice is a bad habit. It's something that we do that does not benefit us in any way, shape, or form. Not only that, another definition for it is that it is immoral conduct. It's something that draws us away from God and causes us to sin. It causes us to fall. And so there are types of vices. So we're gonna be talking about two types of vices. We have on the radar vices, which are the more obvious ones. And we have the off the radar vices, which are the ones that when you think about it, it's like, wow, I didn't realize low key, like I'm really kind of messing up here, right? So on the radar vices, you're on the radar vices, sexual immorality. You already know what time it is. Adultery, fornication, right? Masturbation, pornography right those type of things smoking drunkenness drug abuse those are the on the radar vices the things that you look at it and you know i should not really be messing with this right but then you have the off radar vices you have food sleeping anger gambling now you're probably thinking jay how is sleeping a vice well i'm gonna tell you how it is right because the thing is, when it comes to these vices, they are coping mechanisms. And a coping mechanism is a strategy that people use to manage their stress or trauma. And so there are times that people, they sleep, not because they're sleeping for seven, eight hours to get ready for work or to get ready for school, but because they are in so much pain, they just sleep for hours and hours on end to avoid the issues that they're dealing with in life, food, I mean, we see it all over the country. I mean, obesity is a huge problem in our country. And some people, they eat not for nourishment, not because they like a dish that their grandmother made, but they eat it because they feel good when they eat. It's like they try to consume all of their issues and they take it out on the food that they have. Anger. Some people, they don't understand how anger can be a coping mechanism but it very much is because there are some people that when they get upset, they know their anger. They know the anger of their dad not being around. They know the anger of being violated when they were younger. They know the anger of just being frustrated with their situation. And so they'll punch a hole in the wall. They'll rip something apart. They'll curse somebody out. They'll just walk away and just be upset. And it's a coping mechanism. Now, what's the problem with these things? Whether it's an on the radar vice, where it's a parent, such as sexual immorality, drinking, or an off the radar food and sleeping, it's all the same for this reason. It is you putting something in front of God. It is you looking toward this thing for comfort. 
Because the thing is, if we're really honest with ourselves, you know what to expect when you drink, right? Because if you're drinking, you know that you can expect that you're about to get drunk, you're going to have a hangover the next day, you're probably going to be throwing up, you're not going to feel well, but you'll drink some water and you'll bounce back. When you're angry, you know what to expect from your anger. You'll probably punch a hole in the wall, you probably curse somebody out, and then life goes on. Even when it comes to sex, you know what it is when you are looking toward that to comfort you. You know that you know what, you're probably gonna hit up that person that is in your phone, in a special section in your phone, hit them up, have a little conversation, and you know you're gonna make your way over there, right? But all of these things take us away from God. All of these things destroy us. All of these things prevent us from being healed. Now, what does the Bible say about the flesh? Because when we talk about vices, vices don't do anything for your spirit, man. It's all about your flesh, this body, right? It's all about pleasing yourself. It's all about satisfying yourself. But the messed up part is half the time when you're doing these things, you don't even enjoy it. You're just doing it because that's all you've ever known. And because you know it so well, you know what to expect from when you're sleeping with someone or from when you're drinking or when you're doing something else, you trust that thing more than you trust God. Because with God, it's unknown. You don't know how God is gonna fix you. You don't know how God is gonna figure out the issue in your life, but you can expect that if you sleep with someone, you're not gonna feel good about it afterward, but it is what it is. You can expect that after you drink, you're gonna have a hangover, but it is what it is. You can expect that you're so upset that you sleep and you're gonna sleep for like 12, 15 hours and get up and it is what it is, right? And God tells us things about the flesh. It tells us in Romans chapter eight, verses six through eight. Now the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God both now and forever. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh living a life that caters to sinful ap appetites and impulses cannot please God. Right now, that's a really long verse. The reason why is the amplified version. Amplified version is popping. I have to tell you guys. But why is that important? Because the word of God is telling us right there that our flesh, our carnal nature is hostile against God. The flesh is not about pleasing God. The flesh is about pleasing you. The flesh is not about you getting healing. The flesh is about getting what it needs at that moment. And it is never satisfied. You can try to run away from your problems by sleeping. You will never sleep enough. You can get drunk from now until kingdom come. It will never be enough. You can have as many booty calls as you can fit on your phone. It will never be enough. And that's the thing. We turn to these things over and over, our vices, right? These things that we look for to, to handle us, to keep us, to sustain us. But every time we go back to our mess, every time we go back to that situation, it just destroys us and it takes another piece of us. It takes another piece of your joy. It takes another piece of your peace. It takes another piece of your identity and who you are. And it puts you in a place where you become ashamed. You're ashamed. You're ashamed, you're put down, and you feel that you have no control because every time you go through a situation, that's what you gotta do. Every time you go through a situation, you have to smoke an L. What else does the word of God tell us? Galatians chapter five, verse 16. But I say walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. There goes that amplified version. Habitually, make it a habit. Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. How do we overcome vices, right? We know what a vice is. It's a bad habit, right? We know that a vice is immoral. We know that there are vices that are not so known. Anger, eating, sleeping a lot, right? We know that there are vices that it happens all the time, having sex, smoking an L, 
doing all of these things, right? And we know now that the word of God tells us that our flesh is hostile against God. And God tells us that the way for us to overcome that, the way for us to get to a place where we are no longer enslaved by our flesh, enslaved by our vices, is to walk by the Holy Spirit, right? We walk by the Holy Spirit. And why is that important? Romans chapter 8, verse 13. For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you are going to die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body. You will really live forever. What does that mean? Right. So we just talked about the way to overcome our vices is to walk in the spirit and not according to the flesh. Right. And then we have a verse that tells us that if we live according to the impulses of the flesh, we'll die. But if we live according to the spirit, we live. So what is it to walk according to the spirit? Because we hear this all the time in church. Right. They say walk according to the spirit. Walk, walk in that Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. You need that. Right. But what does that mean? For one, you have to surrender and you have to admit that you have an issue. You have to be that responsible that you have to admit to yourself and to God. I have an issue. You have to admit to God that you cannot keep sleeping around with the same people. You have to admit to God, I can't keep drinking away all my issues. You have to admit to God, I can't smoke an L whenever there's an argument in my house. I can't smoke an L whenever I see my dad hitting my mom. I can't smoke an L every time I fail. I can't smoke an L every time I lose a job. It just can't be it. That can't be it. You have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And for a lot of us, that looks different, right? For some people, listen, after the first two times, they're like, nah, that, that ain't it. I, I got to drop this. I can't do this anymore. And for other people, it's been years that they've been building up these bad habits. And now they're getting to a point where they're just sick of it. But wherever you are, whatever stage, however long you've been dealing and struggling with these vices, know that you have to surrender. And that comes with making a decision. You have to decide that this cannot be your life anymore. You have to decide that you want better for yourself. And you have to decide that you're going to surrender and give it to God. So that's the first step. And that's not something that you need to do out in the open, right? That's something that wherever you are right now, whether you're in your room, your living room, you're in your car, wherever, you can say a prayer to yourself, God, I cannot do this anymore. I can't. I can't. It's not worth it. I'm destroying myself. I'm hurting myself. Every time I try to build myself up, it's like, like I just move like 10 steps backwards. I can't move forward. What happens when we practice these vices, right? What happens when you don't take that step of making the decision that this cannot be it for your life anymore? There are a lot of things. It hinders your deliverance. A lot of times when we talk about vices, it's so easy for us to say, don't do this, don't do that, right? I can say to you right now, don't have sex before you get married, right? And you could be like, okay, but, but like, what does that mean, right? Because the reality is, a lot of times our vices are not because we want to do the wrong thing. But a lot of times our vices are symptoms of a deeper rooted issue. Sometimes our vices are things that we've suffered with from the past and now they rear their ugly head in our present. Some people are sleeping around because they were sexually abused as a child. And so you don't feel that you are worthy. You don't feel beautiful. You don't feel that you have value. And so the only way you can have some type of peace is to give your body away because you felt it was taken away from you as a kid. And so now you want to do things on your terms. Some people, you grew up and everybody around you was drinking and smoking. And so you turn to drinking, you turn to smoking because that helps you numb your pain. It's an escape. 
For some of you people as children, when you would hear arguments or things happening in your home, you would run into your bedroom, you would lock the door and you would sleep. Some people would run in the tub and sleep. Some people would run to their room and sleep. And so the things that you do right now, it's not something that just happened right now, but really think about it. This is something that you've been dealing with ever since you were a kid. And when we leave these vices unchecked and we grow, we grow as young people, we grow into adulthood, we carry all of that baggage and all those burdens with us. And we keep eating, right? We keep having the sex, we keep smoking, and we keep doing these things, but we never take the time to really address, yo, where did this come from? How did I get here? What, what is driving me to do this? It's more than your vice. It's about what is your actual illness? What is it that God has to diagnose in you? What are you struggling with? Why are you angry? Why do you hold things in? Why do you punch walls when you get upset? And that's what we have to get to. So one thing is vices, they hinder your deliverance because God wants to not only treat your symptom, which is your vice, but he wants to get to the very root of your issue. You see, God wants to understand what makes you tick. How did you get to this place? And he wants to heal you of that. He wants to heal you of your pain. He wants to heal you of what you've been through. He wants to take that, and that's not a burden that's too great for him. What else do vices do? They draw us further from God. The reason being is every time God is trying to reel us in so he can deal with us, we push him away farther and farther because of our shame. We're ashamed. We feel like we're not good enough, we're not adequate enough. We feel like we've done too many things. I've slept around with too many people. Like I've, I've, I've smoked too much. I'm too far in, I'm too far deep. God doesn't want me, nobody wants me. No one sees my value, but God sees your value. But because you're so used to being broken, because you're so used to being hurt, you push God away, expecting him to disappoint you like people. But the word of God is clear. God is not man. He is not your, your father who abandoned you. He's not your mother who abandoned you. He's not your boss that disrespects you. He's not the family member that betrayed you. He's not the friend who was speaking bad about you. He's not far from it. What else? Fear. When we focus on our vices and we use them to cope, when we use them for comfort, it increases fear. We become afraid. And the reason why we become afraid is you find security in that habit. You find security in that bad habit. Some people, they angry on the street, cursing everybody out. They have security in the fact that they could just curse somebody out and feel good. You find security in being with someone who doesn't want to commit to you. You find security in smoking. You find security in popping pills. You find security in drinking. You find security in eating Popeyes, McDonald's, checkers. I'm talking about everything. You find security in all of those things because you're afraid. You're afraid to progress. You're afraid to move forward. You're afraid to see your life without these things that have been holding you back for so long. And if you are afraid, then you're in bondage because there's no way that you can be afraid and be free. And so our vices also keep us in a place of perpetual fear where we are unable to be set free. We are unable to know what liberty is. So you could be tuning in Sunday after Sunday or even before the pandemic, you could have been in church and all these people are talking about how they're free and you like, what do I need to do to get me some of that freedom? Because I don't feel it, right? But that may be what you need. What you need is to be set free from this thing that is holding you back, this vice. It keeps you in a standstill. You're unable to progress. You're unable to progress to the call that God has over your life. 
You're unable to progress to where God wants to take you because you're afraid. So you're stuck. You're always stuck. But there has to be a time that you say enough. I can't do this anymore. And that's what God wants from us. That's what God wants. God is waiting for you, for you to say enough is enough. I can't do this anymore. I can't let this thing rule my life. The word of God is clear. We shouldn't be mastered by anything. When Christ died on the cross, guess what? Sin was no longer our slave master. That's what it tells us. Slim, sin was no longer our slave master. We were now free, no longer enslaved to sin, no longer mastered by sin, but now we can master sin through the Holy Spirit, right? And how do you get to a point where you're able to master sin? It's all about what you think on, what you meditate on. I wake up in the morning and I'm waking up at six o'clock in the morning and I'm praying to God because God, I know I have an issue. I know that anything could set me off. I know that anything can get me upset. Early in the morning, I need to be in front of God because I need God to check me from the get. I can't go the whole day without God checking me first because I know that I have an issue. And so what does that look like? Waking up early in the morning and going to God and praying and being honest. I'm not talking about these over the hills and through the valley prayers where they like to show off everything that they know. I'm talking about that honest prayer. That honest prayer where you're telling God about your dirt, where God is all up in your business. You got them crocodile tears coming out, the snot coming out your nose, them real prayers, right? Those prayers where you're being honest and you're being real with yourself. That God, to be honest, I'm a mess. God, to be honest, I keep doing this over and over. God, to be honest, I don't even know how to stop. Right then and there, you are making progress. What else does it look like? reading your word because guess what christ living on earth he gave us a standard he gave us a standard in the way that he lived his life and so as you're reading about christ as you're studying christ right and you're seeing the things that he said and you're reading about the things that he did you start to pick up on game and you start to understand more and more you know what i need to move like this I need to speak like this. I need to carry myself like this. Christ didn't speak out of term. Whenever Christ spoke, it was the truth, but it was always with self-control and it was always with wisdom. Christ was constantly in prayer. That's why he was ready for every situation. Anytime anyone came at him, he was ready. And it's the same thing with us. We have to be in constant prayer. We have to constantly be reading our word. Why? Because today, Shorty may hit you up and you avoid the phone call, but tomorrow someone else is going to hit you up. And the day after that, someone else is going to hit you up. And you need to be prepared for every time, for every time an opportunity comes up to bring you back to that dark place. We always have to be ready. Fasting. Fasting is a huge thing. And in our faith, a lot of times we think fasting is a choice. Fasting is not a suggestion, it's a command. Christ fasted, we're supposed to fast. Fasting draws us closer to God and it weakens the flesh and builds up our spirit man. And the reason why that's important is our spirit man is the one that's connected to God. And so when we strengthen our spirit man through fasting, guess what? God is calling the shots. But when we don't fast on a consistent basis, guess who's calling the shots? Your flesh. So when your flesh feels like doing something, you don't have any resistance. You're unable to resist it because you haven't built up your spirit, man. And so these are the things that we need, people of God. We need to do better. We cannot stay in a cycle where we're hurting ourselves, where we're destroying ourselves. It can't happen. How do we know when these vices take away from God, right? Well, one of them is when you can't give it up. When you 
cannot give up that bad habit, that means it has a hold over you. If you cannot stop eating after a certain time, there's a problem. If you can't just block somebody's number or matter of fact, change your number, there's a problem. If you have to go to a party because you want to be able to drink or every time you see a bottle, you need to have it, it's a problem. It's a problem. So how do you know it's, it's, it's you know, drawing you away from God? The fact that it runs you. That whenever you see something, you already have a reaction. You're like, yo, I have to do this, I have to do this because it controls you. How else do you know that it's, it, it has a hold over you, your time? What do you use your time for? I mean, what you, what you spend your time doing is what you value, right? For people who are workaholics, all they do is work, they value work. For people, they spend as much time with their family as possible, they value family. If you spend a lot of your time drinking, then you value that over God. If you spend any time just out here, you know, entertaining people in your DMs, then you value that over God, right? It shouldn't even be a problem. If you have a problem turning off Netflix for you to pray for 30 minutes, you value it over God. And so right then and there, it's a vice. It is taking you away from God. It's stripping you. It's stripping you. Stripping you of your identity. Stripping you of who God wants you to be. Stripping you of all the power that you have in you. And it should not be. So people of God, I encourage you. You are loved by God. You are understood by God. You are cared for by God. And he doesn't want you to be in this cycle of brokenness and in this cycle of pain. There has to be a day that it stops. There has to be a day where we grow up and we say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. There has to be a day where we take responsibility for our lives and say, I'm not gonna go down this path. I'm gonna do better for myself. I don't care what family you come from. I don't care what your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad does. It's about you. And it's about what you're about to do. And so we're gonna pray for those that are dealing with vices. Lord, Father, God, in the precious name of Jesus, God, we surrender to you. We acknowledge that our righteousness is like filthy rags. We acknowledge that we haven't listened to you. We haven't, we haven't given you the attention that you deserve. We have many reasons for why we're in the place that we're in now. For some of us, we've been hurt. For some of us, we've been abused. For others, it's the only thing, the only way that we know how to manage pain. We don't know a better way. And to be honest, we're afraid of giving it over to you because at least we know what to expect from our bad habits. But God, many of us don't know what to expect from you. Coming to you is a new thing. Coming to you is different. It's something that we've never done before. It's unknown territory. And so it, it, it's scary. Because a lot of things, the, a lot of times the things that scare us the most are the things that are unknown. But God, we surrender to you on this day. No matter what it is, God, we surrender to you, oh God, our sexual immorality. We surrender to you, oh God, our drunkenness. We surrender to you, our drug abuse, God. We surrender to you, oh Father God, the fact that we gamble, that we constantly sleep, that we constantly eat. We surrender to you, oh God, the fact that we have no self-control that we wanna do better, but we don't know how. And God, we pray that even now that your Holy Spirit may minister unto your people. Encourage your people in letting them know that they're not a drunk, but that when they come to you, they're a child of God. Encourage your people in knowing that they have value, that it doesn't matter how many people they slept with, that you still love them and nothing can change your love for us, and that you want to do better with us and for us. God, let us offer up our lives as a living sacrifice to you. Let us be changed. Let us be transformed. Let us be honest. 
and let us no longer walk in fear, but let us embrace the freedom that is in your word, the freedom that we have in relationship with you and the power that you give us to overcome. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I also wanna encourage those of you who may not know Jesus Christ those who, you know, you hear about this, you maybe you've been in church for years, you grew up in a family of people that went to church, you grew up in a family that was Christian, but you haven't accepted Christ for yourself. It's not enough that your grandmother is a believer, it's not enough that your brother or your sister or anyone else is a believer, but you have to experience God for yourself. It can't be everybody is telling you about God. No, you need to know God for yourself. You need to know that you know that God is amazing. And so for those of you who have not accepted Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, now is your opportunity, wherever you are, that you can become a believer. And so we will pray together. Lord God, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my shortcomings. I confess that I have avoided you. I confess that you've spoken to me and that I've tried for so long to be far from you. But God, on this day, I'm ready. I'm ready to surrender to you. I'm ready to give you my all. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. I am here to offer up my life as a living sacrifice. I am here willing to follow you, to follow your standard, to follow your word, to follow your instruction. Father, I don't want it to be that it's me that lives, but that it's you, Christ, that lives in me. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be encouraged, family. Don't be discouraged. You can do better. You are better.